So has the school funding policy in this country produced the equity uh, effects that are needed? More than two and a half decades of democracy, we're still seeing an issue with overcrowded classrooms in the poorest of communities in this country where often children are having to battle for resources and basic infrastructure that many of us in urban areas take for granted, for example, issues such as having a working computer lab. And we're hearing a lot of conversation now if you've got children in private schooling, for example, where children are learning about coding and the rest of it. But for those who go to no-fee schools in particular, that is really a goal that remains far out of reach. Let's speak to someone now who has actually worked on a study looking into some of this, these issues. We're joined by Professor Surya Muthi Maestri from the School of Education at the University of Guazan Natal. Prof, a very good evening to you. Grateful for your time. I was just highlighting some of the more contemporary issues that many of us here in areas such as Johannesburg, if you're middle class, you take for granted as far as your children's schooling. Speak to us about the findings of your study and the challenges in schools in KZN. In KZN, I beg your pardon. Well, uh, thank you, Tabakila, and thanks for having me, and good, good evening to your, view, your viewers. I must start off by saying that this is not news that uh, inequality exists in the schooling system in South Africa. In fact, when the no-fee school system or the policy was first introduced, Researchers like Professor Shireen Mutala and Yusuf Saeed already raised uh, the, the possibility or the, the, chance, the chances that, that South Africa could, could become a lot more of, of a divided society. And they, they describe it as a, as a class-differentiated two-tier system, a system where poor children will attend poor schools and poor parents that, can aff that cannot afford fees would send their children to these no-fee schools, and then you would have a, a segment of rich schools, your ex model C schools and private schools where parents who are affluent and middle class uh, will, will send their children there. Now, we conducted this research study in the greater Durban area with school principals. And these school principals came from, from these different quintiles. So for the audience that doesn't understand quintiles, what the Department of Education did was it classified schools into, into different segments, into quintiles one, two, and three, which were declared no fee schools and quintiles four and five, which were schools that, that had permission to uh, generate school fees and to, to find other ways in which they could, they could supplement their, their, their income. So no fee schools receive uh, monies from the department per child, but our research is showing that, that the fees, that the fee allocation that comes to this system is way, way, uh, below what the expectations are for, for meeting the, the, the overheads and the general maintenance costs of the school. So these fees are used, uh, the fees are coming through the, through the Department of Education to these no-fee schools, um, will cover the electricity, some general maintenance, and it, it, it's barely enough to cover these expenses, and this is what the principals are saying to us. On top of that, we have, we have a system where where schools have been classified as no fee schools or, or, fee, or, or fee schools, but with the migration or, or, of, of communities from deep rural areas and, and peri urban areas into the cities, some of these fee schools, quintile four and five schools, have now had their demographics changed. They are now servicing schools that, uh, where informal settlements have sprung up. And so the, so the population that they are now servicing don't have the ability to pay. So we have a situation where these schools that don't receive funding from the state now have to rely on, on other means to keep their schools, uh, to keep the lights on in their schools. Mm. And what means, Prof, if any then, are they able to turn to, to make up for the shortfall? Well, no fee schools, and, and the schools in the poorest communities really have, have very, very little that they can draw on. In fact, what we've seen over the years and over the last 50 years that we have the system in place, is that there's been a systematic movement of people with money out of townships into, into, the, into suburbia, into suburbs, uh, into schools that they perceive to be offering their children a better package. And clearly there is a better, there is a, there better, there is a better package that these affluent schools can offer. So your question about what is it that we can do is, is, is a big question. It's a complex question, but it doesn't have to be complex. But before I give you an answer, I just want to, I just want to, 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 to present a, a, a bigger picture of, 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 and offer you some statistics as to what the state of the situation is. So last year, the Department of Education released 
uh, release some statistics about about infrastructure in the country, especially in, in, in public schools. And they released the, uh, a report called the National Education Infrastructure Management Report. And there's some startling figures that, that if you're not sitting, but you might fall off your chair. So if you're sitting, you might fall off your chair. So here are some, 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 there's some data, right? Mm -hmm. There are 23,000 schools in the, public, in the public sector at the moment. To date, there are 5,800 schools that don't have a water supply, a reliable water supply. So they rely on boreholes and rainwater and mobile tanks. So on days that the children, some children, the children go use, use the toilet, for example, then there's a strong possibility that these children cannot wash their hands and remain hygienic. There's unreliable electricity supply in 3,000 schools. Here's another really, really startling statistic that as of the report uh, that came out in April last year, 5,000 plus schools still had pit latrines. 5,000 schools, and that, that's a fair number, and, they, and, it's, and it's mainly found in the Eastern Cape, KZN, and Limpopo. 70% of the schools across the country, 17,800 schools, do not have a library, not even a building. So mm. there's, there's, there's a strong chance that children can come through the entire schooling from grade zero all the way up to, universe, up to, up to grade 12 and not have entered a library. So, of the schools, Prof, pardon me for jumping yes. in once more. You've also noted in your study that this has now led to parents seeking other alternatives for their children as far as taking them to fee paying schools, right? But given the levels of poverty in some of these communities, how many of the parents are actually able to do that? How many of them have a choice? Exactly. So, so, so parents who are, who are unemployed and just don't have disposable income are, are stuck where they are. So the system, the system, the system works against them. They have to send their schools, their children to these, to these no-fee schools. And, and, and to, the, to the credit of the principals that we worked with, these principals and their teachers are really trying very hard to keep the schools functioning. You know, there, there's also the issue of, of funds coming in from the state, coming in very late into the bank accounts of these schools. I, I'm going to give you an extreme case, and I obviously can't... Uh, even the name of the school and the principal that, that divulged this information. One principal said to us that, this, that his school borders an informal sector and the parent body took it upon themselves to connect electricity to the schools illegally just to keep the lights on. So this is the kind of, these are the kinds of measures that, that desperate parents are resorting to. So your question as to how, what do poor and unemployed people do? They are, in a sense, they stuck and they caught up in, 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 this, in this particular in, in this system. Now, uh, the way out of it is, is the big question, right? So, so back in, prior to 1994, we had civil society and social movements that were very vibrant, even in the poorest communities in, in, in the country. So we, in my, my, my feeling is that we need to revitalize these civil society movements. We need to harness the energies of school governing bodies, of principals, of teachers, especially teacher unions. Teacher unions, the, the teachers that occupy these schools in these various, in these, in these very, various no fees, poor schools where there are no toilets and no running water, belong to unions. We need to harness to the energies of those unions. Importantly, uh -huh. we have to connect with businesses to change the situation. Because I, I can guarantee you, in 10 years' time, if you call me to an interview to talk about the same, the same system, if we don't reimagine the ways in which we, could, we will address the issues of school equity, in 10 years' time, I will be telling you the same story. Professor Surya Muthi Maestri from the School of Education at the University of Guazul Natal, good to have your time tonight, so thank you very much.